Once at La Providence, there was not enough flour to bake even an oven full of bread. The mill couldn't grind the wheat that had been sent over. There was just enough flour to bake three loaves of bread. When they had seen that there was not enough flour to feed all the girls in the school, they went to the parish priest, Father John Vianney, fondly called the curé. He told them to use the little they had. They took the small amount of flour they had and began to knead it. The trough filled, overflowing with dough, as on days when they had a large sack of flour. Had Curé prayed? Did he ask the Lord to multiply the loaves as he had on the Mount of Beatitudes? It is definite that a miracle was granted by the Lord for Father John Vianney's spiritual children. Saint John Marie Vianney was born on May 8, 1786, in the French town of Dardilly, France. He was the fourth child in a humble family of six children, born to Matthew Vianney and his wife Marie. The Vianneys were devout followers of the Catholic faith and helped the needy. Marie was responsible for leading St. Vianney into the religious life. The turbulence of the French Revolution marked St. Vianney's childhood. It was a dangerous time for religious people, and many priests were forced into hiding. They conducted their ministry in secret, risking their lives in the process. But the VNA family traveled distances every Sunday to worship and pray in secret. Because of this, young John saw priests as particularly heroic to the people. He continued to believe in the bravery of priests and received his first communion catechism instructions in private by two nuns who lost their convents to the revolution. When he was 20 years old, John was allowed to leave the family farm to learn at a presbytery school in Ikuli. There, he learned math, history, geography, and Latin. In 1809, the French government drafted him into its army to fight a war for Napoleon. Although he was already involved in religious studies, and should have been exempted from such service, soldiers were needed. Two days into his service, John fell ill and required hospitalization. As his troop continued, he stopped in at a church where he prayed. At this point, he met a young man who offered to help guide him back to his group. This meeting marked the beginning of a significant event in St. Vianney's life, when the young man led him to a group of deserters who had gathered in the village of Les Noé, deep in the mountains of Les Forêts. The harsh winters isolated Les Noé, and this protected the deserters from surveying gendarmes. St. Vianney lived in Les Noé for 14 months and assumed the name Jerome Vincent. As Jerome Vincent, he opened a school for the village children. When the war ended and amnesty was granted to all deserters, John went to the seminary to become a priest. In 1811, he entered a seminary, but John struggled with his studies. Three years later, he was dismissed because he was unable to grasp the theological subtleties he was supposed to study. But the Bishop of Grenoble was sufficiently impressed by Vianney's firm character and level-headed judgment he ordained John Vianney a priest in 1815. 
He was then sent to the remote French community of Ars in 1818 to be a parish priest. This parish was, at the time, in a very pitiable condition. The fear of God and the practice of virtue were rare things there. The new cure brought a mixture of kind understanding and personal strength to the people of Ars. In the beginning, his sermons were directed against drinking and swearing. He tried to show his parishioners the value of resting from work on Sunday and of going to church regularly. Throughout the entire day, he knelt before the Blessed Sacrament and prayed for his erring sheep. His zeal at prayer was soon noticed. He had no gift for learning but he did have the gift of understanding what was in people's hearts and minds. That made him a wonderful confessor. So people from all over France came to ours and asked John to hear their confessions. Sometimes he spent as many as 16 hours in a day listening to people confess their sins. It took St. Vianney 10 years to bring spiritual renewal to ours, but his perseverance resulted in greater attendance in his church and the people turning away from their vices. Vianney's success as a confessor was accompanied by increased personal difficulties. During the few hours of rest he allowed himself at night, he was disturbed by strange noises, sometimes by such discomfort that he felt he was being physically beaten. Once his bed caught fire. He understood these troubles to be persecution by the devil and reacted by intensifying his own prayers and penances. Dedicated to the Blessed Sacrament, he spent much time in prayer and practiced much mortification. He lived on little food and sleep, while working without rest in unfailing humility, gentleness, patience, and cheerfulness, until he was well into his seventies. It was well known that the saint was a miracle worker. One night, while reciting his prayers, he was seen to rise into the air with his features transfigured, an orb of light encircling his face. The fame of the blessed success and the holy life of the priest of ours spread rapidly. Strangers came in ever increasingly numbers in order to have their consciences set aright and to obtain advice and consolation in every type of need. Next, John began a home and school for deserted and orphaned children. He was concerned that in the wake of war, many people in France had no true religious education, and he used his homilies to try to teach about the faith. For 41 years, John served the tiny parish of Ars. Then, on August 4, 1859, at the age of 73, he died. In his way, he spent himself in the fullest sense of the word as a good shepherd and labored for the salvation of souls until he was 74 years old. Throughout France, people knew the Curé d'Ars as a holy man. He had little learning, but he had much love, and thousands attended his funeral. He was canonized in 1925 and is the patron saint of priests. Saint John Vianney, you lived a simple and austere life, preferring to store riches in heaven. You never turned your back to any of the poor people needing your assistance. Pray that the Holy Spirit enlighten me 
and remain with me always, so that I too may learn to forego material possessions to earn God's grace. May I always value my spiritual health over all the wealth in the world. Believing in the power of your kind intercession, I humbly ask you to pray for me and the special intention I am hoping God will grant me through this novena. St. John Vianney, priest of ours, pray for our priests and pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Paul Deneo lived at a time when many regarded Jesus as a great moral teacher, but no more. Paul saw in the Lord's passion a demonstration of God's love for all people. In turn, that devotion nurtured his compassion and supported a preaching ministry that touched the hearts of many listeners. Paul Deneo was born in Ovada, Italy, in 1694. He was the first of 16 children born to Luke and Anna Maria Deneo. His father owned a small business, but his family struggled financially due to a poor economy. As a child, Paul desired prayer and recollection. His father would read to his children from the lives of the saints and his mother often consoled Paul and his siblings by pointing to a crucifix and explaining how much Jesus suffered for them. At the age of 12, Paul received his first Holy Communion. On that day, his heart was set on fire with the love of God. From that time on, he only wanted to go to heaven and to save souls. The world did not interest him. In 1715, when Pope Clement XI called upon Christian youths to join a new crusade against the Turks, Paul volunteered. Inspired by the ideals of a crusade, he wished to fight against the Turks who were threatening Europe. He went to Venice to enlist in the army. Paul's army career was a disaster. There was endless waiting for embarkation, which was frequently announced but never came about. And he was tormented by the manners and morals of the military. One day, while in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, he was made to understand that this was not his vocation. After unsuccessfully living the life of a soldier, Paul left the military to live a secluded life of prayer. Even though his priest uncle had left him an inheritance that he might marry, he decided not to marry and not to accept the inheritance an uncle had left him. His mother taught him from an early age that the strength to overcome any and all difficulties in life was to be found in the passion of Jesus Christ. In 1718, at Sestri outside of Genoa, at Our Lady of Gazzo Church, Paul saw himself in a vision. In a vision, he saw himself clothed in the habit he and his companions would wear, a long black tunic on the front of which was a heart surmounted by a white cross. Two years later, at a local Capuchin monastery, Paul prayed fervently for an understanding of what had happened at Our Lady of Gazzo Church. On his way home, he received a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary clothed in a black tunic and wearing the Passionist sign. She told him to gather companions 
and to establish an order that would mourn the death of her son, Jesus Christ. Paul went to see the Bishop of Alexandria and told him about the vision. On Friday, November 22nd, 1720, from the hands of the bishop, Paul received his new habit, which later came to be known as the Passionist Habit. After the ceremony, Paul went to Castellazzo with his brother John Baptist and began a retreat for 40 days. Cutting himself off completely from the world, he fasted and prayed and prepared himself to write the holy rule of his newly founded order. He spent as long as five hours at a time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And at the same time, saints from heaven appeared to him, instructing him and praying for him. With the encouragement of his bishop, Paul wrote the new rule of his community. The ministry of this order is to preach about the passion of Christ and Jesus' great sacrifice on the cross for us. The community was to live a penitential life in solitude and poverty, teaching people in the easiest possible way how to meditate on the passion of Jesus, his experiences, and the state of his soul during that 40 days is made known to us in the spiritual diary. Paul taught the people to meditate on the passion. Paul brought the people of God to repentance for their past sins and to perseverance in their conversion to God's way of living. Paul was convinced that the passion would enlighten and strengthen their hearts. Wearing a crown of thorns and carrying a heavy wooden cross, Paul walked through the streets, ringing a bell and inviting the children to come to the church to hear the good news of the redemption. They brought many people back to the church who had forgotten about Jesus' love. Parents and children rushed to the church. The bishop ordered Paul to keep preaching on the streets because it caused many people to come closer to God. After this, Paul sailed for Rome to see the Pope and get his religious order approved. But nobody at the Vatican would let Paul see the Pope because nobody knew who he was. They would not permit him entrance, thinking he was some kind of beggar. Not long after this disappointment, a cardinal said, how many more souls would be brought back to the church if Paul of the Cross was a priest? Paul was encouraged to study for the priesthood. And when he was 33, he was ordained by the Pope himself. After he was ordained, Father Paul preached his sermons so well that the congregation would break into tears of sorrow for their sins. One day, when Father Paul was praying, Our Lady appeared to him, saying, Come to Monte Argentaro, for I am there, alone. He went to live at Argentaro, and there, after seven years of praying and doing penance, he set up his first Passionist monastery. The new order of the Passionists was rapidly growing in numbers. Pope Benedict approved the Passionist rule in 1741. Father Paul continued saving souls. He showed great mercy to men who were outlaws, hardened in their evil ways. He would visit them in their caves or in their woodland hideouts and speak to them about Christ crucified and by his kindness and mercy he was able to convert these poor sinners and bring them back to God. One day a poor man came begging for a piece of bread. Taking the bread, the beggar asked Father Paul, Do you know me? Certainly, answered the priest, I know you, 
you represent Christ on earth. And the beggar said, and if I were Christ himself? Father Paul was confused. He lowered his eyes. When he raised them, he saw Jesus standing beside the beggar. God had rewarded the holy priest for his great charity. The congregation of Passionists grew and expanded. Father Paul was so united to the Passion that it was said that his heart pulsated more quickly on Fridays. In spite of his dedication, Father Paul had to go through a period of darkness. For more than 45 years, he experienced dryness and desolation of spirit. He had no feelings of love, no taste for prayer. He had to live by faith and hope, believing that God was still with him, helping him along the road to heaven. He bore this cross with great love and patience, wishing to suffer like Jesus. And sometime before his death, Jesus rewarded good Father Paul with consolations and peace of soul. The trial had passed. Throughout his many travels while preaching missions and making foundations of his Passionist order, he always carried with him a large wooden crucifix in honor of our Lord's Passion. Thus, he became known by the popular name of Paul of the Cross. During his last years of life, Father Paul set up the order for the Passionist nuns. Paul of the Cross was best known as a popular preacher and a spiritual director. He died on October 18, 1775, at the retreat of Saints John and Paul. Today, there are Passionist priests in 52 nations of the world. They minister to the poor and sick, they teach and preach, and they welcome people to their schools and retreat centers, all to proclaim the mystery of Christ crucified and risen. Paul, our father and brother, as we stand with you before the cross of Christ, may our minds, our hearts, and our lives be overwhelmed by the love shown there for us. As you followed the example of Jesus crucified, may we too be emptied of all things but the desire to do God's will, and so keep alive the memory of the passion and death of Jesus Christ, our only hope. Amen. Few men have merited the title, The Great, and even fewer women have. Saint Gertrude is one of them. She was a virgin, mystic, and Benedictine abbess, and was called by our Lord himself, My Chosen Lily. Although nothing much is known of this German woman's family background, it is widely accepted that she was entrusted to the sisters of Helfte Abbey to be educated when she was five years old. It is also possible that she entered the monastery school as an orphan. Mechtilda, the younger sister of the abbess Gertrude, who was later canonized a saint, took care of young Gertrude. Gertrude and Mechtilda had a strong bond that only grew deeper with time, allowing Mechtilda to have a great influence over Gertrude. The high walls surrounding the cloister broadened the young girl's mind instead of confining it. The nuns there were known for their thoroughness in training and study, which only helped the intellectual gifts that God had bestowed on Gertrude. She devoted herself to her studies and received an education in many different subjects. At a very young age, Gertrude was both fluent in Latin 
and very familiar with scripture and works from the fathers of the church, including Augustine. She also discovered Christ in the monastery and the beauty of living for him and with him in the intimacy of his love. The Benedictine sisters soon realized that she was favored by heaven. One nun who suffered the torment of terrible temptations had a dream in which she was told to ask Gertrude for help and to ask for her prayers. As soon as Gertrude began to pray for her, the temptations ceased. After several years, Gertrude moved from the monastery school to the novitiate, taking the veil and becoming a nun. Gertrude, known for being charming and able to win people over, entered the Benedictine order at Helfta. In 1280, at the age of 24, she went through an inner crisis that lasted several weeks. She felt lonely, lost, and depressed. Her human plans disintegrated. This might have been the end of everything, but instead, it was a new beginning. At the age of 25, Sister Gertrude had a jarring spiritual experience, which would divide her life dramatically into two halves, before and after. Before, Gertrude was a faithful nun, but overly interested in secular writers and knowledge for knowledge's sake. After, she buried her head in scripture, read widely in the fathers of the church, and she always felt as if she was being watched by the eyes of Christ. She devoted herself to personal prayer and meditation and began writing spiritual treaties for the benefit of her monastic sisters. Her fame grew. She became one of the great mystics of the 13th century. The monastery was soon filled with people in search of her words, comfort, and guidance. She had great influence because the reputation of her holiness and her visions attracted many people. Since her conversion, she had become the confidant of Jesus, who revealed to her the infinite love of his divine heart and charged her to spread it among human beings with love for the suffering and for sinners. Gertrude's conversations with Jesus prompted her to write pages that would bring souls to him. More than three centuries before the visions of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in France, St. Gertrude had visions of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In one vision, St. John the Evangelist placed Gertrude close to Christ's wounded side, where she could feel his pulsating heart. Gertrude asked John why he did not reveal the mystery of Christ's loving heart to mankind. St. John responded that his duty was only to reveal the very person of Christ. Together with her friend and teacher, she practiced a spirituality called nuptial mysticism. That is, she came to see herself as the Bride of Christ. Gertrude composed her spiritual diaries at the express command of her spouse, Christ. She embraced charity for both rich and poor. Gertrude's health began to deteriorate, but she continued to only show her love for the Lord. By this time, Gertrude's mystical union with her spouse, our Lord Jesus, was so ardent and intimate that even the thought of sudden death could not disturb her. In fact, she expressed her desire to join her spouse. One Good Friday, images of Christ's wounds, stigmata, appeared on Gertrude's body. For a time, these painful marks bled seven times a day. Word of Gertrude's stigmata spread throughout the country, and many arrived to meet her. So many people interrupted her prayerful solitude in order to view the phenomena. Gertrude asked God to do something about it. So the bleeding stopped, but the marks and pain remained with her for the rest of her life. 
For the next 18 years, Gertrude suffered patiently every day. Throughout her life, Gertrude produced numerous writings, although only a few still exist today. One of her longest surviving works is Legatus Memorialis Abundantiae Divinae Paetatis, the Herald of Divine Love. Her other standing works include her collection of spiritual exercises and Precis Gertrudiane, Gertrudian Prayers. Gertrude's life became daily more supernatural, and often she experienced ecstasies in which she not only enjoyed the company of our Lord, but His Holy Mother as well. Even her favorite saints came to visit her. On November 17, 1301, Gertrude passed away a virgin and joined her bridegroom forever. Apart from her writings, few details of Gertrude's life are known. She left virtually no footprint besides her life of quiet fidelity as a contemplative nun. Like John the Baptist, she decreased so the Lord could increase. Eternal Father, I offer the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus, in union with the masses said throughout the world today, for all the holy souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the universal church, those within my own home and within my family. Amen. Mary Magdalene was one of Christ's disciples. She has been identified with several Marys in the Gospel. Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Mary, the sinner who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. Mary, a woman who cared for Jesus and his apostles on their journey. Saint Mary Magdalene's story is intimately linked with Jesus. She plays a leading role in one of the most powerful and important scenes in the Gospels. How St. Mary Magdalene first met Jesus, we are told in the Gospel of St. Luke. St. Mary Magdalene learned that Jesus was dining one night in the house of Simon. Without waiting for an invitation or an introduction of any kind, she burst through the guests to get to him. Her only thought was to show Jesus how thorough her repentance. For Mary Magdalene, the daughter of a rich and noble family, was reputed a great sinner. The Pharisees present there believed that all sinners remained sinners. They believed that all except themselves were sinners. Mary knelt behind our Lord while he was seated and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And kissing his feet, she anointed them with precious ointment. When Simon, the Pharisee who had invited Jesus to dinner, complained, this man, if he were a prophet, would surely know who and what kind of a woman this is who touches him, that she is a sinner. Our Lord quickly defended St. Mary Magdalene, saying, Simon, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and with her hair has wiped them. You gave me no kiss, but she, since she came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. And then our Lord uttered his glorious tribute. Wherefore I say to you, Many sins are forgiven her because she has loved much. And then he said to Mary, Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has made you safe. Go in peace. After her meeting with Jesus, Mary Magdalene gave herself up entirely to the service of her Lord. She became one of the holy women who followed Jesus in his travels in Galilee 
and up to Jerusalem. For two years, she accompanied him, listening to him preach, drinking in his words of eternal life and ministering to him and his apostles. It was Mary's great love for Christ that kept her standing at the foot of the cross, weeping and grief-stricken until her Savior died. It was her heartbreaking pain of loss that drove her to his tomb at the first light of day in order to anoint his body. She discovered that the stone had been moved away and that the tomb was empty. She was heartbroken and began to cry. A man in the garden asked her why she was crying. Mary thought the man was a gardener and told him that her Lord had been taken away. Then he said her name, Mary. Upon hearing this, Mary recognized him. She was a true saint of hope, running to tell the apostles she had seen the Lord. As a reward for her great love and faithfulness, she is the privileged person to whom Jesus first appeared on Easter Sunday morning. She was the very first witness of the resurrection. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, Mary Magdalene continued her mission as an evangelizer, contemplative and mystic in the heart of the church. According to tradition, Mary gained an audience with the emperor Tiberius in Rome after Christ's resurrection. She denounced Pilate for the way he conducted himself at Christ's trial. Mary told the emperor about Christ and his resurrection from the dead. Holding out an egg to him, she proclaimed, Christ is risen. The emperor was not impressed. He told Saint Mary Magdalene that there was about as much chance of a human being returning to life from the dead as there was of the egg in her hand turning red. Immediately, the egg turned red. This was a sign from God to illustrate the truth of her message. The emperor then heeded her complaints about Pilate, condemning an innocent man to death, and had Pilate removed from Jerusalem. While we do not know if these stories are true with absolute certainty, we do know that the tradition of handing out red eggs at Easter is one that originated among Christians in apostolic times. And we often find Mary Magdalene depicted in icons holding a red egg. Mary spent her remaining life visiting different towns, preaching the word of Christ. The last 30 years of her life, it is claimed, she spent in a cave high up in the mountains. The story of Mary of Magdala reminds us all of a fundamental truth, Pope Benedict said. A disciple of Christ is one who, in the experience of human weakness, has had the humility to ask for his help, has been healed by him, and has set out following closely after him, becoming a witness of the power of his merciful love that is stronger than sin and death. Saint Mary Magdalene, woman of many sins, who by conversion became the beloved of Jesus, Thank you for your witness that Jesus forgives through the miracle of love. You who already possess eternal happiness in his glorious presence, please intercede for me so that someday I may share in the same everlasting joy. Amen. To most Catholics, St. John from Kenty, otherwise known as John Canty or John Cantius, is an obscure saint. But even in Europe, probably few people know of Pope John Paul II's deep and lifelong devotion to this professor saint. Only 13 miles from the Holy Father's own birthplace, John was born in the small southern Polish town of Kenty 
on June 24th, 1390. At the age of 23, he registered for studies at the Jagiellonian University, located in the not-too-distant city of Krakow, then the capital of the Polish kingdom. He studied philosophy before entering the priesthood at the university. After ordination, John became a professor at the university, eventually rising to be the head of the philosophy and theology departments. During this period in history, priests and monks dedicated much time to quiet study and most of all, copying manuscripts. In this age before the printing press, the only way to replicate anything was to manually write it out. John spent many hours of his life copying down Holy Scripture and other theological writings. Even today, 18,000 of his handwritten pages survive, and that's only believed to be a small fraction of his life's work. John worked hard for many years without any sign of success. He was very careful not to demonstrate his impatience or anger. He was known for his generosity and kindness. He rose in popularity, which put him at odds with some of the other professors. Rivals who resented John's popularity cooked up false charges against him. John was not even allowed to appear at his own hearing or testify in his own defense. With rising dissension, he was sent to serve at a parish in Olkusa, a small rural town in Bohemia, which is now part of the Czech Republic. His parishioners were not welcoming, and they had every right to do so and it was not a job for which John was well prepared either. However, he was determined that his new parishioners would not suffer because of what happened to him. But there was no overnight miracle waiting for him in Old Coos. He was nervous and afraid of his new responsibilities, and despite the energy he put into his new job, the parishioners remained hostile. But John's plan was very simple and came not from the mind, but from the heart. He let his genuine interest and concern for these people show in everything he did. He knew that people could never be bullied into love, so he gave them what he hoped they would find in themselves. After eight years, when he was transferred back to Krakow, he had been so successful that these once hostile people followed him several miles down the road, begging him to stay. John was now reassigned back to Krakow. He was reinstated at the University of Krakow, where he became professor of sacred scripture. John Canty was renowned for his scholarship and his simple and even austere life. He had no bed, slept on the floor, and never ate meat. When his superiors told him that he was being too hard on himself, and endangering his health, he remarked that the desert fathers, who lived very austere lives, lived to a remarkable old age. Although honored by the nobility of Krakow, he was well known to the needy whom he favored. On several occasions, he distributed all that he had to the poor. Devoted to the truth, he told his students to fight all false opinions, but to do so with courtesy. He made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. His goods and his money were always at their disposal, and time and again they took advantage of him. 
He kept only the money and clothes absolutely needed to support himself. He made four pilgrimages to Rome, carrying his luggage on his back. One day, he was accosted while traveling and robbed of the few pennies he had. His robber asked him if he had any more, and when John told him that he did not, the robber left in anger. At that point, John placed his hands in his pocket and discovered an additional gross. Unwilling to even unintentionally tell a falsehood, he chased after the robber to give him his last cent. The robber thought he was being pursued, and a foot race ensued. John Canty won the race, and with the robber lying on the ground, John handed him his last penny. The man turned from his life of crime because of John Canty's goodness and his absolute devotion to the truth. One of the most famous stories surrounding Canty is the supposed miracle of the jug, depicted in the painting hanging above the altar in Chicago's St. John Cantius Church. In June of 1464, an elderly Canty was walking through the market square in Krakow when he observed a weeping girl with a broken jar. It was a servant girl who had been carrying a jug of milk for her stern mistress when she had dropped and broken it. She was crying for fear of punishment. Moved with compassion, Canty took the broken jar from the girl's trembling hands and prayed upon it. Miraculously, when he fitted the pieces together, they remained whole and the jug was fixed. He then told the girl to fill the jug with water from a nearby spring. When she brought the jug filled with water, Canty again took the jug and prayed upon it. When he returned it to the girl, the water inside had turned to milk. John taught his students this philosophy again and again. Fight all error, but do it with good humor, patience, kindness, and love. Harshness will damage your own soul and spoil the best cause. John Canty died on Christmas Eve in 1473, with Krakow being convulsed with sorrow. He provides us with a model of devotion to the truth, love of poverty and simplicity, and a model of charity. Grant, we beseech thee, O Almighty God, that by the example of St. John, thy confessor, we may make progress in the science of the saints, and by showing mercy to others, may obtain through his merits forgiveness from thee, through our Lord. Amen. Throughout his life, as the Knight of the Immaculata, Saint Maximilian Maria Kolbe was born in Poland in 1894. His father, Julius Kolbe, a working-class citizen, struggled under Russian rule. His mother was Polish. They had a tough time raising their three children, Francis, Raymond, who was later named Maximilian in his religious order, 
and Joseph. Julius joined the Polish legions and was captured by the Russians for fighting for the independence of Poland. He was later hanged to death. Kolbe was an impulsive and badly behaved child. His mother prayed for him every day to Mother Mary. She prayed to her guiding her son. Kolbe, according to several biographies, was personally called by the Virgin Mary, both to his holy life and to his eventual martyrdom. One day, she appeared to him in a vision holding two crowns. One was white, representing purity, the other red for martyrdom. When he was asked to choose between these two destinies, the troublesome child and future saint said he wanted both. Radically changed by the incident, the young boy chose both the path of sanctity and of a martyr from that day. At age 13, Raymond Colby became fascinated by the Franciscan ideals preached by two conventual Franciscans who conducted a parish mission at his church. Soon thereafter, he and his elder brother Francis left home to enter the Franciscan Minor Seminary in Luau. This seminary was in Austria-Hungary and it meant illegally crossing the border. During his formation and study there, the makings of a saint continued to deepen. He practiced what he learned, making sacrifices and helping others at every given opportunity. But most of all, he nourished a tender and profound love for the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose devotion is at the very heart of Franciscan life. In 1910, Colby was allowed to enter the novitiate he professed his first vows in 1911, adopting the name Maximilian, and the final vows in 1914 in Rome, adopting the names Maximilian Maria to show his veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary. After a short period in Krakow, Poland, Kolbe went to study in Rome, Italy. He gained a doctorate in philosophy at the Pontifical Gregorian University in 1915. In 1919, he also gained a doctorate of theology from the University of St. Bonaventure. Colby was ordained as a priest and after completing his studies, returned to the newly independent Poland in 1919. Soon after, however, he developed chronic tuberculosis, which eventually destroyed one of his lungs and weakened the other. Throughout the rest of his life, he experienced poor health, but never complained, seeing his illness as an opportunity to suffer for Mary. Colby was an active priest and particularly keen to work for the conversion of sinners and enemies of the church. During his time in Rome, he witnessed angry protests by the Freemasons against the Vatican. Colby had a strong devotion to the Virgin Mary and he became an active participant in the Militia Immaculata, or Knights of Immaculate. Colby helped the Immaculata Friars to publish high pamphlets, books, and a daily newspaper, Mali Dezinek. Colby even gained a radio license and publicly broadcast his views on religion. He was successful in using the latest technology to spread his message as well as writing extensive essays and pieces for the newspaper. Colby composed the Immaculata Prayer, the consecration to the immaculately conceived Virgin Mary. When he returned to Poland as a young priest, he was appointed professor to the Franciscan seminarians in Krakow. He soon had an attack of tuberculosis, and along with his failing health, he was deemed unsuitable for the task. But his zeal for souls, characteristic of a true saint, did not diminish because of his physical ailments. He promoted faith through newspapers and magazines, which eventually reached an extraordinary circulation. There were more than 800 friars, all working for the Immaculate, 
that it was called the City of Immaculate. They lived heroic lives of poverty, continuous prayer, and voluntary penance. They were united in their mission of evangelizing not only Poland, but the whole world. Between 1930 and 1936, he took a series of missions to Japan, where he founded a monastery at the outskirts of Nagasaki. Colby decided to build the monastery on a mountainside, that which many people believed was not the best suited to be in tune with nature. Later, when the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Colby's monastery was saved because the blast of the bomb hit the other side of the mountain, which took the main force of the blast. Had Colby built the monastery on the preferred side of the mountain, as he was advised, his work and all of his fellow monks would have been destroyed. He also entered into dialogue with local Buddhist priests, and some of them became friends. However, increasingly ill, he returned to Poland in 1936 and reassumed direction of their publication. It had now become the largest Catholic publishing center in Poland, possibly in the world. In 1939, Nazi regime invaded Poland. Father Kolbe was arrested and imprisoned in the Pawiak prison and later transferred to Auschwitz death camp. Father Kolbe was put in a barrack along with other prisoners. The next day, one of the prisoners escaped, and this made the authorities furious. The commander ordered 10 random prisoners to be starved to death in order to deter further escape attempts. One of the prisoners who was selected for the starvation bunker cried out in grief, lamenting his family. Father Kolbe although not among the selected, volunteered in a heroic act of charity to be the victim in place of the prisoner who was crying. Rather surprised, the commander accepted Colby in place of the prisoner. During the time in the cell, he led the men in songs and prayer. At every inspection, when almost all the others were now lying on the floor, Father Colby was seen kneeling or standing in the center as he looked cheerfully in the face of the guards. Father Colby never asked for anything and did not complain. Rather, he encouraged the others. One of the guards remarked, This priest is really a great man. We have never seen anyone like him. After two weeks, nearly all the prisoners, except Colby and two others, had died due to dehydration and starvation. The Nazi commander then asked the guards to execute Colby and other prisoners with a lethal injection. On the vigil of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, August 14, 1941, Father Maximilian's two-week ordeal in the starvation bunker was brought to an end. Those present say he calmly accepted death, lifting up his arms, smiling. He was the last to die, very providentially on the feast of Our Lady's Assumption. Saint Maximilian Kolbe's body was cremated by the camp officials on the feast of the Assumption. He had stated years earlier, I would like to be reduced to ashes for the cause of the Immaculata, and may this dust be carried over the whole world so that nothing would remain. Pope Paul VI beatified Maximilian Kolbe in 1971. In 1982, Saint Pope John Paul II canonized him as martyr of charity, calling him patron of our difficult century. At his canonization in 1982, Pope John Paul II said, Maximilian did not die, but gave his life for his brother.
Maria Goretti, affectionately called Marietta by her family, was born in Coronaldo in 1890 on the eastern side of Italy. She was one of five children of Luigi and Assunta Goretti. In 1899, her father, Luigi Goretti, moved the family to La Ferriere di Conca, 40 miles from Rome, looking for a job. Luigi soon got a job as a sharecropper, and in exchange for farming work, his employer let Luigi's family stay in one of his houses. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dear, I have found a place for us to stay. Really? Yes. My employer has let us at one of his houses near the farmland. Marietta, go pack your things. Let's go to our new home. Thank you, God. This house had two floors. Luigi, Assunta, and their children stayed at the ground floor. Giovanni Serenelli, a widower, and his son, Alessandro, lived upstairs. Both families tried to survive together, exchanging their crops and belongings. One day, Luigi Goretti was bitten by a mosquito carrying the malaria virus. Tragically, he died 11 days later in 1900. This incident left poor Assunta to raise her five children in the new and strange town of Ferriere, all alone. God, please give me the strength to raise my kids. Thankfully, she had Maria to help her. Though a good deal of her life before her martyrdom is seemingly veiled, we normally only hear about the end. Maria Goretti was afraid that her father's soul would remain in purgatory for too long, so she prayed constantly. This habit of prayer led to a long, practiced meditation on the Paschal mystery. The rosary was constantly tied around her wrist since, and she could not go long without praying it. In order for the Goretti family to survive, Maria's mother, Assunta, took her husband's place in the fields. This left Maria, as the eldest girl, to take her mother's place in the home. Maria cooked, cleaned, did the laundry, and cared for her younger siblings. Their neighbor, Giovanni, had a drinking problem, and he was prone to loud and immodest language. But he did like Maria, like his own daughter, as she often helped them with chores. Marietta, my child, I am feeling very sick today. Do you mind cleaning the kitchen a bit? Alessandro made a mess of it, trying to cook yesterday. Don't worry, I will take care of it. Would you like to have some soup? That would be a pleasure, darling. You are such a good girl. Additionally, she cooked and cleaned for the two Serenelli men. Maria never complained about the extra work she had to do. She was a source of encouragement to her mother, assuring her mother that Jesus would provide for their needs. Maria was a pious child. Although she could neither read nor write, she learned her catechism and received her first Holy Communion with great reverence in 1901 on the Feast of Corpus Christi. She went to Mass as often as possible and grew in virtue, sanctity, maturity, and beauty. It was from Assunta that Maria learned never to sin at any cost. We belong to God totally, body and soul. Our body is God's temple, and the Spirit of God is living among us. At 11, Maria was already a beautiful young woman. Alessandro, then 19, twice made advances toward her. Stop it! Don't touch me! Alessandro, it's a sin! Alessandro was taken with Maria's beauty and had for some time tried to seduce her. He spoke obscenely to her, made lewd suggestions, and threatened to kill Maria and her mother if she told anyone. Alessandro was the typically depressed young teenager. 
His mother had died in a psychiatric hospital while he was young. Following his father's footsteps, he drank too much. Although he was once Catholic, he had fallen away. Despite his persistence, Maria did not give in to temptation. This angered Alessandro, and one day, his anger got the best of him. On a hot day in early June, Maria was sewing up a shirt while her mother and siblings were out on the farm working. Giovanni sat down to rest, saying he was sick at the bottom of the stairs leading up to where they lived. Seizing an opportunity for evil, Alessandro left his work and came back to his house. He saw his father dozing off at the foot of the stairs and went up into the house without making any sound. Alessandro snuck up on her and began to attack her. No, no, you mustn't. What you are doing is a sin. Alessandro grew even more angry when she resisted and then took out his knife and stabbed her. He then quickly left the building before anyone could see him. Alessandro's father woke up to the loud noise. When he entered the house, he found Maria in a pool of blood. Help! Help! Maria is wounded! Maria is wounded! Somebody help! Maria's body was horribly mangled. It was a miracle that she was still alive. The neighbors soon arrived and gasped when they saw their beloved Maria. They asked who did this terrible thing, and she whispered, It was Alessandro. He tried to make me do something that was a sin, but he couldn't make me do it. He couldn't. I wouldn't let him. Maria was immediately brought to the hospital in Natuno. The doctors were astonished that the girl was still alive. They said it was hopeless and she will not survive for long. A parish priest was called to give Maria her last rites. As she lay dying, when the parish priest of Natuno brought her holy viaticum and asked whether she forgave Alessandro, she replied, Yes, I forgive him and I want him to be in paradise with me someday. Her mother, in tears, gave her the crucifix to kiss and that comforted her. Don't worry, it is Jesus whom I shall soon see in heaven. Maria died the next day on July 6th at the age of 11 years and 8 months. A large crowd gathered at her funeral, and each of them was aware of her martyrdom. The cops soon arrested Alessandro, and he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Because he was an angry young man in constant fights, he was placed in solitary confinement. He was completely unrepentant for his crime, and his heart was hardened. However, six years later, Maria appeared to Alessandro in a dream. In his dream, his prison cell turned into a lush garden, and Maria came to him bathed in light. She gave him 14 lilies. After he took the lilies in his hands, they turned into flaming lights. At this point in the dream, Maria told him that someday his soul would join hers in heaven. That was all too much for Alessandro. Until this point, he had been unrepentant of his crime, but immediately his heart began to soften and he wept after so many years. He called for the bishop, confessed his crime, and lived out the rest of his sentence as a reformed man and model prisoner. After his release, he sought out Maria's mother that he might beg for her forgiveness. Alessandro, Marietta forgave you. Christ has forgiven you, and why should I not also forgive? I forgive you, of course, my son. Your evil days are past, and to me, 
You are a long-suffering son. Since her death, Maria has been the instrument of numerous cures and miracles. Along with 30 other witnesses, Alessandro testified as to Maria's sanctity during her cause of beatification. In 1950, she was canonized in a ceremony attended by a quarter million people, including her mother, the first mother ever to see her child canonized. Maria Goretti is an excellent model and intercessor for today's youth, confronted by a sea of immorality poured out on the world by the modern media. She offers children and young people a refuge, protection, a serene spirit, and the deep joy of the pure of heart. St. Hervé is venerated throughout Brittany, but we have few reliable particulars on him. His life was not written about until the late medieval period. All we really know is that he was a hermit in Brittany, where he is still highly venerated, and where Hervé is one of the most popular names for boys. Hervé's father is believed to be a British bard named Hyvarnian, a pupil of St. Cadoc, lived at the court of Childebert, king of the Franks. After working many years for the king, the bard took permission from the king to visit his native land. One day, as he was riding through the woods in Brittany, he heard a young woman singing. The sweetness of her voice made him curious, and dismounting from his horse, he made his way through the trees. He finally found the owner of the sweet voice. There she was, gathering herbs near a pond. For a moment, Hyvarnian stood and gazed with open mouth and happy eyes. He approached the woman, and asked her what the herbs were for. She held up a sprig of green in her right hand. See, this is the vervain, she answered. This brings happiness and heart's ease. But I seek two others which I have not found. The second opens the eyes of the blind, and the third, few may ever find that precious herb the third is the root of life, and at its touch, death flees away. Hyvarnian, forgetting his homeward journey, in that hour loved her, and later he married her. After three years, they had a son who was born blind, and in their sorrow, they called him Hervé, which means bitterness. When he was two years old, his father died, and the mother, Ravanon, and child were left poor and friendless. In her grief, she sang to him, and he grew up to profoundly love poetry and music. And when they had nothing to eat, they went into the street to sing to passers-by to earn some money to make ends meet. People liked their songs very much and gave them alms eagerly. When the boy had grown a little, Ravanon fell ill and lay in bed. Thus, little Hervé decided that it was his turn to labor and earn his and his mother's bread. But he was unable to walk without a companion, for he couldn't see. By divine providence, White Dog was sent to him. The child wandered about the countryside singing and begging, led by the dog, which he held on a string. To this day, the Britons sing a ballad of the blind child, led by his dog, singing as he shivered in the wind and the rain. 
with no shoes on his bare feet, his teeth chattering with the cold. When Hervé was seven, Rivanon gave him into the care of a holy man named Arthian, and she became a hermit. At age 14, he joined his uncle who was a hermit and kept a monastic school in the forest at Pluvian. His uncle welcomed him, and soon Hervé had such a love for prayer and monastic life that he never thought of choosing another path in life. Soon it emerged that Hervé, despite his blindness, surpassed all other students both by his abilities and diligence. Upon his uncle's death, Hervé became the abbot. Every morning, the children gathered to be taught by their blind master. He instructed them in music and poetry, and above all, in the Christian way of life. When you wake up in bed, he said, offer your hearts to the good God, make the sign of the cross, and say with faith and hope and love. In addition to his teaching, Hervé worked the fields near the school. One day, he was working on plowing the field with other farmers. He took a break after some time and left the donkey unattended. Suddenly, a wolf came out of nowhere and killed the donkey. Hervé came running when he heard the sound. When he realized what happened, he spoke to the wolf very sternly. His words affected the wolf so strongly that this wild animal, in its remorse, harnessed itself to the plow. Then he helped Hervé till the entire field. From that day, the same wolf served Hervé instead of the donkey and pulled the plow itself. It slept in a cowshed together with oxen and was as meek as a lamb. Later, he decided to move the community to Léon. There, the bishop wanted to ordain him priest, but Hervé humbly declined. Established at his new location, he branched out into healing the sick. Even the local frogs would stay quiet at the sight of his harp and an uplifted finger. From his monastery, where he lived for the rest of his life, Hervé would travel forth periodically to preach. He was no longer led by a white dog, but by his little niece Christine. She lived near him in a cottage of thatch and wattle, built for her by the monk. As his monks watched at his deathbed, they were said to have heard the music of the heavenly choirs welcoming him to heaven. So died the blind Briton saint who had taught in the school in the forest and who all his life, despite his blindness, had given glory to God. After his death in 556, Saint Hervé was buried at Lonarneau in Brittany. Almost immediately, his fame spread throughout Brittany. Today, his feast is celebrated on June 17th and considered the patron saint of the blind, bards, and eye disease. Saint Hervé, who even though blind, saw God's love in all all creatures, pray for us. Saint Germain Cousin found God in the fields she worked. 
the sheep she watched over, and even her own suffering, despite terrible abuses from her stepmother and abject neglect from her father, Germain lived each day with patience and compassion for everybody she encountered. Germain was born in 1579 to poor parents. Her father was a farmer, and her mother died when she was still an infant. She was born with a deformed right arm and hand, as well as the disease of scrofula, a tubercular condition. Her father remarried soon after the death of her mother, but his new wife was filled with disgust by Germain's condition. Little Germain had been given so little food that she had learned to crawl in order to get to the dog's dish. The stepmother ignored Germain for days, and with this kind of treatment, she became even more ill. Instead of awakening Hortense's pity, this only made her despise Germain more for being even uglier in her eyes. Germaine found no sympathy and love from her siblings. Watching their mother's treatment of their half-sister, they learned how to despise and torment her, putting ashes in her food and pitch in her clothes. Hortense did finally get concerned about Germaine's sickness because she was afraid her own children would catch it. So she made Germain sleep out in the barn. The only warmth Germain had on frozen winter nights was the woolly sheep who slept there too. The only food she had were the scraps Hortense might remember to throw her way. She tended the family's flock of sheep every day, another way to keep the ugly child out of her stepmother's sight. Besides minding the sheep, Germaine was required to spin a certain amount of wool every day. It is difficult to see how, with her crippled arm and hand, she could do this work since it called for considerable skill and dexterity. But it was required of her even when the weather was so cold that her fingers were stiff and hard to move. Nothing Germaine did, however hard she tried, would please her stepmother, who found one excuse after another to vent her inhumane rage upon Germaine. This little girl was frequently covered with bruises and welts from a woman drunk with hate. Germaine, though, turned this banishment into a closer relationship with the divine. From the meadow where Germaine was herding sheep, she could see the parish church, whose lofty tower resounded every morning with the silvery voice of the bell calling the faithful to Mass. One day, feeling so ardent a desire to attend the holy sacrifice, she called her sheep together and planted her spindle in the ground next to them. Then, making the sign of the cross, she ran to church. Germain was overjoyed when she returned to discover her sheep were quietly resting about the distaff and under the shade of an oak tree. She began to repeat this same practice. And though the place was infested with wolves, which committed ravages on other flocks, she never lost a sheep or lamb. Rain. Snow or storm never prevented her from following this holy practice. 
Many times, neighbors would be mystified, finding Germaine's flock huddled obediently around her distaff. Her sheep, guarded by what she called her guardian angel, were never attacked by the wolves that prowled the French countryside. One day, after a strong rain, the creek had become a raging stream, making it impossible for her to reach the church. Two peasants of the region, who knew her custom to attend daily mass, came to laugh at her predicament. They saw the poor shepherdess walk straight toward the river without any hesitation. As she set her foot in the raging stream, the waters separated, allowing her to cross. Just as the waters of the Jordan had opened for the Ark of the Covenant to pass, after she reached the other side, the waters returned to their tumultuous course. The peasants watched this with awe and fear, and then reported the miracle to the whole village. She shared spiritual stories with the local children. She often gave her meager food scraps to beggars. Although she never went to school, she was a diligent pupil in the school of divine love. The catechism that was taught by verbal instruction, both from the pulpit and in the little Sunday school class, she learned by heart, storing it in her memory, pondering it diligently throughout the week. Often, she would stay in church long after everyone else had left, kneeling for hours on the hard flagstone floor. Germaine's profile grew one winter when her stepmother accused her of stealing bread to give to a beggar and hiding it in her apron. Her stepmother pursued her into town, hoping to expose her to the townspeople as a miscreant and a thief who was stealing from her household pantry. After catching up with her in the public square, she forced her to reveal the contents of her apron. When Germaine opened her apron, it wasn't bread that came flowing out, but summer flowers. It was the middle of winter. Everyone was amazed and began to see Germaine in a different light. The stepmother, however, was unmoved and continued to persecute the young girl until her death. This wasn't for much longer, as Germaine soon died alone in the barn where she had been forced to live for 17 years. One night, two traveling monks decided to take refuge for the night in a forest near Pibrac. They were sleeping when they were suddenly awakened by the sound of a marvelous singing. They looked and saw two angels amidst a splendorous light who were passing through the forest towards Pibrac. The vision disappeared, but after a while, the group reappeared again. This time, the cortege of virgins was coming from Pibrac but one more virgin had joined the group. It was Germaine wearing on her forehead a crown of fresh flowers. The monks were charmed by this heavenly vision and spread news of it everywhere. The following morning, Germaine did not appear to take charge of the sheep. Her father went to seek her in the cubicle and found her dead on her simple pallet under the stairs. She had fallen into her final earthly sleep. She was 22 years old when she died. Her legacy grew, but it was not until her body was accidentally exhumed nearly half a century later that Her Holiness was fully realized. When uncovered, 
it was discovered that Germain Cousin's body was incorrupt. What's more, the scars left from a lifetime of illness and neglect were faded. With this realization, the village reminisced on her life and deeds, and many more miracles were attributed to her, mostly in the form of healings and interventions on behalf of the abused and disabled. In 1864, more than 250 years after her death, Saint Germain was canonized as patron saint of people with disabilities and those who have been abused or abandoned. Oh, Saint Germain, look down from heaven and intercede for the many abused children in our world. Help them to sanctify these sufferings. Strengthen children who suffer the effects of living in broken families. Protect those children who have been abandoned by their parents and who live on the streets. Beg God's mercy on the parents who abuse their children. Intercede for the handicapped children and their parents. Saint Germain, you who suffered neglect and abuse so patiently, pray for us. Amen.